Good morning, family. It is so great to gather with you. I love each week gathering and being in God's Word. We're still in John, so open up your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to continue in chapter 8. We're going to be 12, verses 12 through 20. Last week, we, we saw that amazing uh, story, that amazing incident where the woman was dragged in be, before Jesus and um, committed, and she was been caught in her sin, but then we just saw how Jesus treated her, and he caught her in, her, in his grace, and he forgave her. And it flows with John's um, teaching and his writing style, excuse me, his writing style. We have an incident, and then we have a message. And then we have an incident, and then we have a message. Well, today it's going to be that message. And Jesus is going to make a very bold, extravagant claim today. And it's going to get the Pharisees all fired up. They were already fired up. Those guys, it doesn't take much to fire them up. And they're already passionate about trying to silence Jesus. But now they're going to go even into higher gear. And so before, though, we do that, I was wondering if you guys, I don't see the title slide up there. There we go. Let's do it. Let's, why don't you guys do me a favor and stand up as we say this together as a family. I just got my Bible on my lap. I'm all ready. It's all right. You guys can rearrange it. Trust me. So let's say this together as a church. Are you ready? This is why John wrote this book. Ready? Go. But these... In his name, remain standing as we pray. Father, we are desperate. We are desperate to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. As we open up your word, as we examine your word, Lord, may we see you in a clearer light and a clear understanding. And then, Lord, may we take that clear understanding and that clear light and then, Lord, take it to the world that is in darkness. So, Father, speak to us. Holy Spirit, empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. John chapter 12, verse, excuse me, John chapter 8, verse 12. Ready? Here we go. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from, and I know where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus, again, makes a very extravagant, very bold claim today in our text. And we're going to handle the text a little bit differently. I am going to actually start 
and verse 20. Verse 20 is where I'm going to start to kind of dissect this text, and we're going to look at this text together, but I'm going to start in verse 20. I'm not going to start in 12. We will talk a little bit about 12, but then my main points are going to start in verse 13 and so on, and then we'll close the message with verse 12, really looking at verse 12 and dissecting it. But starting in verse 20, he says, these words he spoke in the treasury. So many times when, when scripture gives an indication of where something is happening, a lot of times we just read right over it like it doesn't have any significance. But this is very significant in where Jesus is actually making this claim. Because if you know the temple, there is the courts of the Gentile, where the Gentiles, that's the only place they were allowed to go. They were not to go any further. But then there is the court of the treasury, or it's also called the court of the women. And in that location, women, men, and Gentiles who were professed or who professed their faith and trust in Yahweh and followed the steps, they could go into that section of the temple. And then you go further in and then you have the, the court of the men and then the priests and so on and so forth as you get closer and closer to the Holy of Holies, where only the priest was allowed to go in. But Jesus, it says, he says this in the treasury. It would only make sense that the place that they put the, the, the offering receptacles where, the most, where, the, where, where were the most people allowed to be in. You know, that's because they wanted everybody to be able to have the chance to give. But that's where Jesus is saying this. He is saying this claim where the most people were, where the most people were allowed. He's saying and he's making this bold, extravagant claim here. And now let's go back up to look at verse 12. But it says in 22 that, they wanted to arrest him. Again, they're all fired up, but they knew that it wasn't his time yet, so they couldn't. Now, back up to verse 12. And again, Jesus spoke to them. Here he was. The Feast of Booth had just ended. Then Jesus says in, in, in chapter 8, verse 1, that he sat down and he was teaching them, remember? And then the woman gets uh, caught in adultery, and she's dragged in front of everybody, and so there, he was interrupted. Then Jesus deals with that story, shows how we should love those who are caught in their sin. Remember the love acronym that I use that we, we listen, we offer support, we verbalize God's truth, and then we esteem because they have value as created images of God. And then, so then it says, and again, then he starts to speak to them. Now he's going to give this proclamation. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, remember that verse. We're going to go back to it when I dissect it a little bit more and we look at really what is this claim. But Jesus makes this bold, and the Pharisees got it. We have to understand that's why they're fired up. They understood, and hopefully today when you walk out of here, you will understand or have a greater understanding of what Jesus is really proclaiming here. The Pharisees knew it right away. So look at verse 13. They say... So they, the so Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So here they are. They're bringing up an argument that they already settled in chapter 5. If you remember, as we've been walking through the gospel of John, in chapter 5, they brought up the same thing. Who are your witnesses that you can be proclaiming and professing these types of claims and so back then jesus handled it it's in the in the jewish law you needed at least two or three witnesses to back up your claim but jesus gives them four witnesses and i will go over them again in case you forgot them so jesus says it is my works that bear who I am, that testify to who I am, the very things I do. It is JB. Do you remember who JB was? John the baptizer. He's the one. JB, 
testifies to who I am. Then he says, the Father testifies, which that should be enough right there when you say it's, fa- it's the Father But when you know the context in what Jesus is talking about and who he's talking to, the thing that would carry the most weight, which it should be the Father, but the thing to the Pharisee that carries the most weight was because they claimed to be what? Students of the Scripture. They knew the Scripture. Then Jesus' fourth witness, the little pinky one, was it's the Scripture. It's the scripture that bear witness. The very scripture that you claim to know and understand and trust and to base your life on, that professes and testifies to who I am. But see, Jesus, they bring up that thing again, that whole witness thing, but he doesn't, he'll talk about it a little bit more. But here's the issue. Here's the problem. Have you ever talked to somebody and you tried to explain to something, something to them? But you can tell that they are walking in self-righteous pride and they don't hear a word you're saying because they're in their own pride. You know what I'm saying? If you had that conversation, that's exactly what's happening here. The Pharisees are proving that they're walking in self-righteous pride and so they're not listening or understanding anything Jesus is telling them. You ever been in a discussion, we'll say, with your spouse and you know, or you know even yourself, you're walking in your own pride. What do you hear your spouse saying? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you're like, no, I'm right. I know I'm right. But all you hear is wah, wah, wah. Like, what's that Charlie Brown and the teacher, you know? Wah, wah, wah. That's all. You guys have been there in those discussions, right? Jesus is having that discussion with these guys, the Pharisees. All they hear every time that Jesus makes a proclamation and he tells them something, because of their walking in their self-righteous pride, they hear wah, 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 wah. So I wonder to myself, self, when you're not listening to God or hearing from God, are you walking in self-righteous pride? Are you? Here's the thing, self-righteous pride will either cloud, diminish, or give us the inability to hear what God is doing and what God is saying in our own lives. How he wants to guide us, direct us, challenge us, conform us more into the image of his son. When I'm walking in my self-righteous pride, no, I got it all figured out. One of my favorite sayings when I was growing up and my mom, praise God, didn't choke me out, was she would try to teach me something, and I would say, yeah, I know, Mom. I know. I know, Mom. You don't need to. No, Richard. No, I know, Mom. I know. A lot of us today are walking around that same thing. No, 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 I know. You don't need to explain it to me. No, 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 you don't have to. No, I know, I know. And the Pharisees were doing the exact same thing, walking in their self-righteous pride. But this verse also says something that I think is important about human nature, By nature, humans are very skeptical. We don't trust one another. If somebody makes a claim, we usually say, what? Prove it. We don't take them at their word anymore. You know? Now, if I were to make a claim that, Richard, that I can run a mile in four minutes, you guys would all be like, right? You got to prove that, Richard. And if I went out to try to prove it, I'd probably die on the track, Okay? Like, it would, I wouldn't be able to do it. But there's so many times where people say, oh, I this, or I did that, and you're like, yeah, right. You know, I'm from Missouri, the show me state. You got to show me, because I don't trust you. That's exactly what the Pharisees are saying. Oh, sure, you're going to make this claim. And man, it speaks to this claim. This claim is huge. And we're going to get to that. Trust me, we're going to dissect this claim. But that's what it's showing also. Look at verse 14 now. Look at how Jesus answers them. He says, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. Jesus is telling them, even if I make this bold and this extravagant claim, it doesn't make me a liar. And so often today we look at somebody that makes this bold claim and we want to assume right away, you're a liar. You're not telling the truth. But Jesus is saying, 
I'm not that. Just because it's this bold and extravagant claim, I am not. Listen to how he defends that. My testimony is true. Listen to what he says. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from or where I am going. What is Jesus talking about right there? He's talking about his identity. I know who I am. I know that this, this claim, and we're going to get to it, is big, but I can claim it because I know who I am. If I were to make the claim that I could run a mile in four minutes, I better be able to do it. I better be able to back it up. I better be able to prove it. Jesus is saying, I am so secure in my identity in God that I can make this claim. And we, you know, there's so many people searching for their identity in their job, in their marriage, in their children, in their sexual identity, all these things that we try to profess that we're trying, that's my identity. But we will never be more secure in our identity than when we say my identity is a child of God. That's it. My identity, it's not what political party I vote for. That's not my identity. My identity is secure because I am in God and I am in Christ. There's another thing that makes our identity very, very secure is we recognize that I know where I came from and I know where I'm going like Jesus, but I know that I'm a child of his and I know I'm doing his will. I'm obedient I'm obedient to the Father. We will never be more secure in our identity until we realize who we are in Christ and when we're following his will and his purpose for our lives. Look today in our reading plan, even we see Gideon. And the angel appears to Gideon, and Gideon's hiding, if you don't know that. And he's hiding so that because he's afraid. And the angel appears to him and says, strong and mighty warrior. Gideon's like, no, I'm hiding down in here, man. You must have somebody else. You must be thinking of somebody else. He needed to know his identity in God. And then he needed to know that God had a purpose for him, and he followed it. The same way with our lives. We need to know who we are. So let's keep reading, because we have a lot to get through, and I need to get back to the light of the world. Listen to Jesus in verse 15. You judge according to... To the flesh, I judge no one. The Greek word right there for judge can also be translated condemn. It's so I'm going to read it again. You condemn according to the flesh, I condemn no one. What did he just tell the woman caught in adultery? Where are those that condemn you? And he says, neither do I condemn you. You see how that word changes right there? Condemned. But here Jesus is being actually condemned for the claim that he made. That's what's really going on. They're judging him. He's saying, you're condemning me because of this claim, but your only way to condemn me is because of the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit because you are so self-righteous and walking in so much self-righteous pride. You can't judge according to the spirit. You can only judge according to the flesh. And so I started thinking about this and I started thinking, how often do we condemn those outside of our faith tradition? It says right here, Jesus says, neither do I condemn anyone. He didn't condemn the woman that we just heard about that was dragged in front of him. He didn't condemn her. So when we get caught up in condemning those outside of our faith tradition, what we are actually saying, and I want you to think about this. We are actually saying, well, yeah, John 3, 17, right? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We then say, Oh, but if that's why God didn't send Jesus, he must have sent me to do it. I must be the one 
Maybe Jesus missed the mark, so then I will do it. I will show them that I can condemn the world. Now, there's a, there's a difference between judging and discerning and condemning. We can look at the world and we can say, yeah, what they're doing is not correct. But the condemnation is not from us. It should never be from us. It was not even from Christ. Now, will there be a day that he will come and he will judge? Yes, he will. And he will do that because he judges. Listen to how he judges. Listen, listen to this. He says, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. He recognizes again how he judges. And then he says in verse 17, in your law, and I love how it says in your law, but in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. So now he's going to address it. He didn't first address it, but he's going to address it a little bit. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So I will provide you the two witnesses. I will do it again. And, you know, again, in John 5, he did four witnesses, and here he's just doing two, himself and the Father. Listen to the fleshly or human response to that. In verse 19, they said to him, therefore, where is your father? My point in here, if you're taking notes, is, all right, then where's your daddy? Go get your daddy. This was such an insult to a Jewish man. What they were basically saying to him is, you are not walking in understanding. You are blinded. You are confused. Now go get your dad who can set us all straight. Do you understand how humiliating that is to a grown man? Even think about that in our own culture. If somebody were to say to me, Richard, go get your dad because I don't believe you. I'd be like, what? It's me. You can trust me. But this is when we look at it even deeper. This is what they're even doing that's worse. They're saying, we know the story about your birth. We know, yeah, you were miraculously conceived. Not only because they are judging in their self-righteous pride of like, no, we don't even trust you, go get your dad. But they're saying, we don't even believe your birth. We don't even, now, if you are really not the illegitimate son that we have come to believe because you've told us this story about this virgin birth, well, then go get your dad. Again, walking in self-righteous pride diminishes our understanding of who God is and what God is trying to do in our lives. You see, the very, they, they say, and, and I love Jesus' response. He, he understands what they're saying, and this is what he says. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. Again, this is the religious leaders. These are the guys that are supposed to be teaching about Yahweh. He says, neither do you know me nor you know my father. Because if you knew me, you would know my father also. You see, Jesus is saying right there that I have conformed my life so much into the image and the practices of my father that if you look at me and you examine my life, you've now seen God. You know, and I thought to think to myself, who do people see when they examine my life? When they look at me, do they see Jesus? Or do they look at Richard and they see his pride, his arrogance, his cockiness? Is that what they see in me? But Jesus is saying, you know neither me nor you know my father, because if you see me, you know the father. So we've looked at now the response of both the Pharisees and Jesus. But what 
led to this response is so very important. Go back up to verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Remember when we talked about it in John chapter 7, where I told you the rituals at the Feast of Booths was that when G, when the priests would go and get those gallon jugs or big jugs of water, and then they would pour it out in front of the altar, and then Jesus stood up and he says, if anyone thirst, come to me. Remember when I said that and that dramatic effect that he had, like saying, you're seeing water poured out, that I'm it, come to me. Now what we need to understand when he's standing up in the treasury court, and he's saying, I am the light of the world at that very festival that just had, end, had just ended, where they gathered to what? Remember God's faithfulness throughout the 40 years in the wilderness and how Jesus provided, excuse me, God provided water, right? Jesus now stands up and says, I am the light of the world. It's another huge dramatization. See, what they had in the court of the women in the treasury, right where he was talking, during the feast, they had set up huge lamps, huge lamps, that they say when they were lit, they would actually light the city of Jerusalem. They would light the whole city. Now, these guys are probably even taking these lamps down because the festival had ended. And Jesus now stands up and he says, I am the light of the world. The light that you have been celebrating and looking at and cherishing and honoring, I'm that. I am that. So when you remember what is the Feast of Booths talking about, it's talking about God's faithfulness and how did God guide the children of Israel through the wilderness with a pillar of a cloud and a pillar of fire, light. He is saying when he stands up, and that's why these guys got all fired up, when he stands up and says, I'm the light of the world, you know what he's saying? I am God. I am God in your presence. And even though they're taking these lamps down that you've been honoring and worshiping and be so excited about, when they take those down and now the world is in darkness, I am that light. I am that light. He's professing that he is God in their presence. And what did God do with the light? He guided the children of Israel. He protected the children of Israel. He provided covering for them at night and during the day. When the Pharaoh's army was charging at them at the Red Sea, what did the happen? The fire went behind the people and made a protection for the people to be able to cross the Red Sea. God, Jesus was saying, I am that God. In your flesh, right here, I am that God. Colossians says that we see, when we see God, the very nature of God, we see excuse me, Jesus in the flesh. So let's look at this. Let's break this even down, this statement even more. He says, I am the light, not a light. In our world where there's so many distractions and so many things trying to get our attention and turn us away from God, he's saying, no, I am the light, not a light. And he says, I am the light of the world. When God was present with the children of Israel in the desert, he was a light to who? The children of Israel. They were the ones following. But Jesus is saying, he's taking it a step further and saying, I'm not just a light to the children of Israel. I'm a light to the whole world. Because listen to what he says. Listen, to, let's keep breaking it down. He says, I am the light of the world. Only the Jews who follow me. Does your text say that? No, it says what? Whoever. It's an open invitation to say, follow me. 
But see, here's the deal. Do we recognize that our world is dark? Do we recognize, it's easy to sit there and say, yeah, 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 the world is dark. But when, we're our, when we are sitting in darkness, I can see who's looking at their phones. <laughs> but when we are sitting in the darkness of the world, do we recognize that? You see, when it's dark, and yes, we can see some light now, but when you think about darkness, like utter darkness, where you can't see your hand in front of your face, it is paralyzing, isn't it? It causes anxiety. It causes fear. You don't know which direction to go. You are caught in darkness. Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world. He is saying, here I am. Come and follow me. Now, I'm not Jesus. But could you imagine if it was, again, completely dark in here? Just like the world is dark, even though it might have lights that we seem to be attracted to and lights that we seem to chase after that promise to give us hope and love and prosperity, but they never deliver. But when Jesus, if we recognize that Jesus is the light, the only light, and now he gives us this what? invitation to what follow him imagine if it was pitch black in here like it's pitch black in the world and jesus stands up and says i'm the light who's following him to get out of the dark who's going to do that all of us should all of us should we can turn the lights back on now but all of us should be following him. But what does that mean to follow him? It means to completely surrender. When we recognize that, man, I was living in darkness, and you have transferred me from the darkness to the light, it means I surrender. I abandon all of my desires, and I Say, you are the light of the world. You give me purpose. You give me hope. You see, light will always dispense darkness. Darkness cannot stop the light. And in our own life, if you're walking around in lies of the world, come to the true light of life and follow Jesus and it will dispense the lies of this world if we want to walk with joy we need to step out of the darkness of sorrow if we want to walk with purpose we need to follow after the light that leads us and when we walk and follow it says that we will have, what did it say? The light of life. You ever sat with somebody and talked with somebody and you've conversed with them for a while and you feel drained? Like they just suck the life right out of you? You guys know what I'm saying, right? But if you sat with somebody and you're like, wow, they just encouraged me. I feel life again i feel lit up we when we go and spend time in god's presence and follow the light we now have the light of life and we should be taking it to where a dark world instead of standing here on our high places and condemning the world we need to be taking our light to the world 
and exposing the darkness, but also exposing Jesus Christ of who he is, the true light of the world. So that is what's for us today. I want, when Jesus makes this bold proclamation in front of these guys and they get all fired up, it's because he's saying, I am God in your presence. And you walking in your self-righteous pride want to condemn me and judge me. Whereas if you followed me, you would be giving life to those around you and not condemning them. When we walk in the light, we're out of the stone-throwing business. Go back to the story right before. The Pharisees, though, dropped their stones but walked away from the light. When we are shown and revealed our own sin, we should walk to the light, spend time in his presence, and then be the light to the world like Jesus wants us to be. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your claim that you are the light of the world. And Lord, it is not just a claim. It is a fact. It is a reality. And Lord, I pray that we would see that and that we would recognize that. That, Lord, if there are people in here who are walking in darkness, I thank you that they came. I thank you that they're here. And, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in such a powerful and clear way that they would desire to let go of the darkness and follow after the light. And, Lord, for those of us that have been walking with you for years and years, that we would continue to spend time with you in your presence so that we now can be the light of the world. You call us even the city on a hill. We'll get to that, Lord. May we be that light that shines for you. We will never, never be the light of the world because that's your role. But Lord, help our lights to shine as we're proclaiming you in a dark and hurting world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead.